So on to exercise two, we're going to go straight into that pretty much. I don't have much to say. Um, what was I going to do? I was just going to remind you, I think these instructions are not in the exercise, but I would set your iterations down before you start doing wrong. I think they're set at 100 and there's no multiprocessing on. So I would, I showed you how to turn the multiprocessing on before the break and I would lower your iterations down to say 40. It should be just fine for the purposes of this uh, course. Um, the other thing is that if you have my slides, I, I just threw it up, but we I forgot to add a bonus question. So uh, always have a bonus question so that um, people that get done early have something to look at. So this is the bonus question here, um, but it's, again, it will be in your slides. And so the purpose of this exercise, just high level again, is this is the exercise one, um, what we did, of course, is we used this screen in here for setting your initial conditions to be um, non-spatial. Um, this exercise here, you're going to switch to a spatial um, example where you're going to bring in some raster maps of your landscape. Um, you'll see them introduced in the, in the exercise. So uh, I think the exercise was um, fairly obvious what you're trying to do. Um, we can look uh, at a couple of these to the results. So let's just look at the two scenarios, one where you created a spatial simulation and one where you created one of the size distribution. So the, uh, the intent of this exercise was to show you, I think, first of all, let's just go back one. Right, go to the non-spatial. So you had this non-spatial uh, simulation and a spatial, and the intent was to show you that the results of the two simulations are identical because we started with the same initial conditions um, spatially that we did non-spatially, and we used the same model parameters, so we get the same output out either way. Now, this is part of the reason we can start with these models aspatially when we're first developing them, you know, understand the dynamics aspatially before we bring in the big GIS layers and really get encumbered with um, the spatial dynamics. And you'll see, uh, well, you already saw a bit in this exercise that as soon as you bring in uh, spatial information to try to run, run, model, run your model spatially, you have some extra parameters to provide to characterize that spatial variability too. So that allows you to postpone that a bit when you're first developing a model. Uh, run times are a lot faster with an aspatial model, so it allows you to debug and, and test and, and play with your model. Uh, but this just that was the first point of this exercise. Next was to show you the, the idea that you could run a model spatially but um, in textbook terms, in landscape ecology anyway, we wouldn't say that this first scenario was spatially explicit. And so the reason we say it's not spatially explicit is because, as you probably discovered, um, even though we're running it with spatial data, every cell is run in, running independently of its neighbor, right? it knows nothing of its neighbor. Uh, so for something to be spatially explicit, um, cells need to be tied to each other, assuming that that kind of dynamic is important to your system. Of course, with fire it is. Um, if we look, um, I think in the next exercise we'll look at it a bit more, but we expect there to be some spatial autocorrelation in the pattern of burns, and a lot of disturbances work this way, and so we want to have a model that reflects that. Um, that's going to be important if later we're generating projections and say we're modeling something like habitat on top of that, that in its, it also requires or, or is sensitive to um, the spatial pattern of your landscape that we characterize that spatial pattern correctly when we're modeling the vegetation change. So what you should have seen when you did this right is um, first in the transitions, 
Um, if we look at uh, the pattern of transitions across our landscape, oh, I got 160 maps here, it's gonna take a second. Um, for fire and harvest under two different scenarios, let me just, I guess four columns. No, that's not what I wanted on, four rows, crop. Um, I'm gonna wait again. I won't do that again. <laughs> you get the idea. But in the in the first simulation where the model was spatial and we didn't express size distribution for how our transition should occur across the landscape, we get this speckled kind of output um, where every cell is equally eligible for transition uh, randomly in each time step. And when we went ahead and characterized, told the model something about the spatial pattern or size distribution of our transitions, the model then is able to put down transitions that follow that size distribution pattern. You'll notice the harvest we didn't characterize spatially with any kind of spatial autocorrelation, so it continues to have a speckled pattern. And just to reiterate how that works, right, we were looking at this input that we added over here under the advanced tab, spatial size distribution. Um, and here we described for the model the expected frequency distribution of events for fire, size for fire. And so we were telling it basically that um, this actually turns out to add up to 100, doesn't have to, but um, that 40% of our fires will be 0 to 1 hectares in size, 30% will be between 1 and 100. 20% between 100, uh, 1 and 10, 20% between 10 and 100, and 10% between 100 and 1,000 hectares in size. So if we were to post-process and analyze the um, size distribution of these events, we should see it matching that, although events can coalesce in the simulations. Um, and if you want more information, like. This algorithm that we have in here for creating the spatial autocorrelation is just one of many ways that you could create spatial pattern on your landscape. And tomorrow we'll look at some ways where you can, you can do it a little differently. You can use actual fire data to, to characterize it directly. Um, but this is a model we have where we, we throw events on the landscape and we sample them from this distribution. Uh, with some randomness, and, and, and there's more to the algorithm. I won't go all into it all, but there is a paper we have um, that describes that algorithm. It's this paper here. Maybe, um, Bernardo, you can um, send it around to participants. Um, but this is another paper of ours from three years ago that um, uh, in the supplementary material for it, no, actually, no, it's in the main main body. There, the, the, the actual model that we use is described there. So if you're interested in more details on really how this model works and how it samples and so on and so forth, you can put it there. But this is um, just one of many ways that you could introduce space for autocorrelation into your transitions. It's a simple one. Um, any questions about... That I guess the last thing just before I bring questions is, you know, we 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 saw the that the transitions were autocorrelated. Um, you see a similar um, pattern emerge then in the actual um, vegetation that's projected on your landscape as well, right? Which is what you'd expect. If we're going to throw here at the in the top simulation, we have um, the vegetation and the age going out over time without any spatial autocorrelation. And you can see the result is a very speckled, fragmented landscape um, after 20, only 20 years of throwing random independently burned cells on your landscape. Whereas here, when we start to introduce that autocorrelation in the transitions, we get a corresponding autocorrelation in the ages and the vegetation composition as well. So let's take a look at the bonus. So um, 
going to get out of this model. Um, what, what I did for the bonus is I created two scenarios. So I took this last scenario that we were just looking at with this size distribution in it. And I think the bonus said something about, um, so I did one where I modeled fire suppression. So I wanted to extend the fire return interval by four times natural levels and limit fires to 10 hectares in size. So I did that by um, coming in here. So the first thing I wanted to do, right, was similar we did in the bonus in the first question. I wanted to modify the fire probabilities. And so I said I wanted to extend the fire return intervals by a factor of four, which would mean reducing the probabilities to one quarter of these values. So I could go in and hand edit them, but just uh, so you see where we're headed in the next couple exercises from now, what I actually did, that's not the right one, here it is here, is I left the, the transitions as the probabilities, these are called the base probabilities in here, and then over on an advanced tab called transition multipliers, I said for fire, I want to scale all the fire probabilities by a factor of 0.25. So this is a we're going to get into this tomorrow. These multipliers, you're starting. We're starting to use the word multiplier over and over. You're starting to get the a feel for where you spend most of your time. Um, but this is an example where you could just shift quickly for a gaming purposes all the fire transitions down by a certain amount. So that's how I did this. You could have edited them by hand. It'd be pretty quick in this exercise. And then I also wanted to change the um, size distribution of my uh, fire events. So I went in here and it was open to interpretation. You know, this is the kind of information you get. Well, fire suppression limits fires to 10 hectares in size. And well, how do I adjust this? It's, you know, it's up to you, right? But what my simple thing was to do was to just lop off all the fires that were greater than 10 hectares in size and left the distribution of the small ones to be the relative amount that they were, right? These don't have to add up to 100%. They're just relative scalings. So I changed my fire distribution size distribution to be this, but you could have done it in different ways. And when I did that then, uh, that was one scenario. And then I did a second scenario where I left the suppression off and I just turned off the harvest, which I did by simply setting the harvest here to zero. Now, if you, there's a temptation in STSIM to uh, just delete the harvest. Remember the original scenario looked probably like this. Um, and you might've thought, okay, I'll just come in here and delete the harvest and run my scenario. But there's a, big problem with doing that. And you'll this is a problem that you run into regularly with, with our framework. And that's because if you recall over on the pathways um, for harvest, if uh, you'll see here, we use this convention of setting the probability of the harvest to one. So if I took the target off here, STSIM would say, oh, there's no target. I want to use your probability, it would have set the probability to one, and it would have harvested your entire available landscape with a full probability one in the first time step. So we had to actually explicitly set the target to zero for it to zero out. Either that, or we could have come over here and removed the target and actually set the probability here to zero. But generally we we set these things up once and we tend not to touch them. So those are my two scenarios. And I ran those two scenarios, right? Um, let's just look at the results I had. So let me get rid of the ones that are already there. Let's get rid of these two on. Um, and this is what I saw, right? As this is, the red is no harvest and the blue is with my fire suppression. So fire suppression, you can see it reduces the amount of fires that I'd expect. The harvest doesn't. And I get, um, it looks like more conifer. Now, what did I actually ask in the question? I said, 
which has the greater potential for retaining the older conifer forest? So I asked about older, not total conifer forest, right? So this is the total conifer. So how can I tell which how these two strategies are behaving with respect to just old conifer? Well, I needed to create a new chart. So um, for me to do that, I had to do through a couple steps. If I want to see just the older conifer, the first was I'd have to go up to my definitions and make sure that my ages were set up to report on. And I think by default they weren't. Um, so I went in and told it to, you know, report ages every one time step. I put this in. And then on this grouping, I told it how to group um, for reporting purposes. So I edited these two things as well. Um, and actually, just to make it interesting, let's change this to 30. Um, so I can see right around 30, 40. Um, let's just do something like this, 60, 80. You can make these whatever you want. That'll be a little bit more interesting. And so um, I then created a chart like this, where I um, said, OK, I want to just get the old conifer forest, right? So I'm going to look for it. That's part of state class. I'm going to disaggregate. No, I'm not going to disaggregate. I'm just going to do some filtering on that. And I'm going to ask just for the conifer forest. And I want it just of old age. So let's say I just want it starting at age 40. I mean, again, I didn't tell you what I meant by old age, but let's suppose that we decide 40 is old age. So now I can do this. Um, and it's updating the age. And so this is this is the graph I get. So this is um, how much old conifer there is um, with no harvest. And this is with fire suppression. And why am I not getting, oh, what was the original one? I didn't have the original one on with harvest and no suppression. So those that's the graph I get. And so it does look like from the age 40 and above that the no harvest does a better job of preserving my old conifer. But, you know, if I look, made my boundary age 30, oh, it's still doing the same thing. Now, why? This wasn't the result. Of, have I done something wrong here? This isn't what I expected. No, but it is. Is that? Did anybody else try this and get get a similar result? Did anybody else look at the age? I didn't look at the age, being the impatient person that I am. Um, but that's my conclusion, anyway. Is that the harvest was making a bigger just now? That's assuming I modeled everything correctly. Um, We look over here at the total conifer. The total conifer with suppression is doing better. I guess if if, uh, if I bring this down to age 20, um, that should be all the conifer. There we go. So that's making a difference, right? If if I'm looking at conifer age 20 and older, now the fire suppression scenario is doing better, right? So my definition of old makes a difference to which strategy I think is better. Here with all the conifer, I think it's, it starts at 20 um, and older. Now the suppression scenario seems to be doing better than the harvest. Does that make sense? The one comment, if you want to try this, is that if you like to get the, to be able to create these age charts, you have to set those age definitions before you run your scenarios. Actually, I was able to switch them afterwards. Right? You can change the groups, but you got to set the types. Right, right. You have to turn on the age. So um, you had to, you had to have this stuff turned on. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Cause it won't, it won't report on the ages for the tabular outputs unless that that particular data sheet is populated and then you can switch the binning later yeah anyway that's uh that's the bonus question yeah just just a quick 
question, Colin. Um, does, does the framework support um, like cellular automata type modeling where the state of one cell is a, is a function of what's immediately around it or some distance around it? Uh, yes, it does. Um, so uh, you'll see, we're not going to go into it this month. Actually, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll show it a bit. Um, when will I show it? Well, I could show it right now, I guess. Um, Actually, Colin, you may want to run, I don't know if you have time or not, you decide, but uh, when you're looking at the fire, the size distribution, there's all these juicy menus below it. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, a lot of fire calls just geek out on that stuff, and that's what they actually want to know if you did the slope correct or the direction with the prevailing winds, and it's all in there. So let me let me actually bring up to answer that question. It's a good segue into um, something I was going to show, which is a uh, I told you I promised you that I would show you other model libraries as we go along. So I'm going to show you a different one here. So this is. Um, the library that goes with that 2016 um, foundational paper in methods and ecology. Um, and so it's a model of actually the state of Hawaii and it's a fairly simple model, um, but it purposely tries to look at a bunch of different features that are available in STSIM um, just to sample them. So if, if you follow, the nice thing about that paper is you can, you can look at the paper and follow along the description of the model as we were already doing. Um, so wherever that is, papers. So let's just take a look. It's this one here. Ah, for some reason, my computer's giving me trouble on that drive. Just a second, get it from here. And so this is a model that I'm gonna to refer to a couple more times in the course um, so it's the one that goes with this paper and if you go to the supplementary of this you can actually download the actual sim files um, they're they're archived uh, and bring it on your computer and kind of play with it yourself if you want um, but this is a model that um, this is the highlight let me get to the case study so this is just to give you an example. I, I, this is a, sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna get to your question eventually, but I think I'll just introduce this model first, and then I'll show you how we applied some of the um, techniques that you're asking about. So this is just a, another example of a pathway diagram, and this is one that uh, this is a format that gets used um, is very popular now. Um, it's a model of land use land cover change. So you can have any boxes you want, but these boxes, if you look at them, this is agriculture, it's a slight variation, but forest, shrub, grassland, developed, barren. These are things that you can generally pick up off of Landsat imagery. And so, you know, there's a, there's a plethora of data available around the globe now at 30 meter resolution where you can pick up um, this, these kind of classes quite readily um, off of Landsat classified data, right? There's data sets, and I don't know what there is in Australia, but in the US, you know, they have land use land cover mapped every five years for 30 years now, I think. So it's a good long time series in Canada. They have it for 20 years, I think. And so we can build models and parameterize them for anywhere in either of those two countries, anywhere in the continent now, we can build a model like this with these kind of classes. Um, so this, this is an example of that kind of a model. It'd be, you know, the, the transitions that you get are sort of expansion and contraction of, of different land use types, urbanization, you can throw in fire, you can have harvests, I mean, you can make them, you can customize them. But the general idea is they're using land use land cover change classes off of Landsat. One of the things we want to do is model this urbanization. Okay, it's an example. So urbanization, we know we expect it to spread out from existing urban areas. So in this landscape, um, if I zoom in a bit, um, um, you can see the red is our urban areas. So I don't know for those of you that know Hawaii. Um, Let's just go down to the big island. 
So this is actually no black is black is is urban. So here's here's um, you know some urban areas on the Big Island of Hawaii. And so if we're going to model urbanization transitions out into the future, we want them to spread out from the existing areas. That only makes sense, right? And so if you look at this paper, um, the way we do that, it, we end up with transitions that look something like this. So this is this is the uh, pattern of transitions that you might expect. Actually, I think I have it in SD in Supercin here. Um, I look at this and this to results. So what we end up with, if we look at um, urbanization, is we end up with this is a map where we're summarizing the probability of a cell transitioning due to urbanization summarized over all Monte Carlos and all time steps. So you can see this is the big island of Hawaii that there's a higher probability of uh, urbanization occurring in and around urban areas, existing ones, and, there, and it gets lower and lower as you go away from those existing centers. And so you're getting this uh, spreading dynamic using adjacency that you're asking about. And so the way we modeled that in this particular example is we used a feature, um, some of these other features under transition spatial. Um, and the one we use there is one called adjacency multipliers. So this is a bit cryptic to follow, but the basic idea is that you tell it that for certain transition, if I go down here to urbanization, that it has a certain neighborhood radius that it wants to look at for nearest neighbors to decide if it wants to transition. And then down on this other screen here, you'll kind of tell it how that probability decreases as you get further away from an existing neighbor that is already in a particular state. So that's an example. Again, it's more complicated than that, but of ways that you can generate spreading behaviors. And there's there's a few other, um, I don't know if Leo or Louis, you want to speak to any of the other ones that you guys use under that menu. Um, sure, especially since the behaviors of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Go ahead, the other Mary. example um, where we use this is looking at um, exotic species spread. Um, so we've used both this feature, like I think that when we were modeling uh, wetland invasive species at Point Pelee National Park, we used this feature uh, where there was kind of a, you know, you were you would expect your probability of getting new invasions to be much higher if you have a lot of neighbors that have that exotic species present already. And um, there's another feature that is similar where you define dispersal kernels. Um, so that's under transition spread distribution, where you can define that a specific uh, state class is contagious for a specific transition type. So again, if you're you're in the invade and you can specify the sort of the, the shape of that spread distribution in this kind of like you defined a size distribution, you can define the shape of that dispersal kernel here as well. Yeah, so um, tomorrow, um, I mean, the, the, the history of these things is um, people ask us for these kind of shortcuts and this list has been built up over, over a decade, right? Of just spe specific ways of kind of controlling the autocorrelation in different different patterns. Um, you'll see tomorrow, we're gonna use the more, most generic one of these, which is what's called spatial multipliers, where you can, you'll see that you can basically do any pattern you want if you can describe it using some external model. And in fact, what we now do to, to back, you know, to your, your, your question about um, agent-based models, I think it was, we have, we have some people, Leonardo's working on a project where um, you can now call out from SD Sim to an external model, and in his case, he's calling a, program, a software called NetLogo, which does agent-based models. And so you can run a model however you like in a different program, a different environment, and it can do stuff. You can respond to your landscape at that time step, give you back uh, 
one of these maps that tells you where and when to disturb things based on its calculations, and you can apply those in STSIM. So in the limit, you can write a script or call another piece of software, or build any kind of model you want, and kind of hook it in at this stage in the process to generate any spatial pattern you want. So there's a lot there. <laughs> Long, long answer to the question, but it's a good question because um, um, yeah, there's a lot of rich functionality there. Any, any, uh, any other questions? Somehow I've lost the window that shows all the people. Oh, there you are. Kristen here. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been thinking about what the analogy is for um, climate change as a as a driver. Um, it can drive, you know, transitions at a certain time frame and change them due to different temperature and rainfall. And it could also drive directionally things in the landscape. And I'm just thinking about some of the models that we've done in the past and how that provi provides information content. So how to parameterize um, something in here. You know, have you had people come to you looking at how climate change inter interacts with systems? and how they parameterize for that? Yeah, very much. I mean, it comes up in uh, most projects these days. Louis is going to jump in in a minute because he's done a lot of work on that himself. Um, so I'll let him sp speak to it. But before we let Louis loose, <laughs> Leonardo, do you have anything you want to do? You want to mention any anything about it? Uh, yeah, a couple of examples, I guess. Uh, we do a lot of work also uh, using species distribution models to parameterize um, the models. So you can, over time, using those spatial multipliers that Colin was showing, vary probabilities of transitions. And if you're using sort of climate data, then you can sort of look at the effects of climate and how they would sort of move transitions across the landscape over time. Uh, I think that Hawaii mod didn't the Hawaii model uh, call and use some climate projections as well to look at sort of uh, transitions between uh, wet and dry and mesic sort of zones. Yeah, that one has a simple example again in that paper. If you look at that paper and um, take a look at it, there's a little section where we, you know, again we ran an, an external model that made some projections about the changes in um, these ecotypes over time, and so those are captured quite easily um, and you'll see in the next exercise we're going to get into stratification so um, it'll make more sense then but um, that's another way that we can do it we've had uh, I've done another well actually that forestry paper that I just showed you modeled you know climate change effects on uh, fire frequency and we did it in a sort of what if again we took projections from other sources and integrated them in so um, there are lots and lots of hooks to bring in climate. You start to see it. I mean, you'll see it more and more. Um, you're really, you know, modifying one of the or more of these inputs that you're seeing. You're either modifying the underlying landscape. You're modifying the way the transitions occur, where they occur, how often they occur, what pattern they occur. All those levers are open to you. It's up to you to kind of figure out for your question and your hypothesis how you want to bring all this together. And 